<sighs> so, we'll finish up today our, our Bible study on the resurrection of Jesus, and then we'll find a topic for next Bible study. Ten minutes ago, you were on fact five. <laughs> we're back, fact five. Fact four dash three for good measure. No, so over the last the last few weeks now, we've been talking about this um, stuff. Jesus resurrection. We've been talking about it since Easter, which is really cool because that was like eight weeks ago, and I'm really, really happy to do that. Um, but let's open up with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this chance to come together to study your word. Lord, I ask that you would bless this time. We might learn more about about you and about what Christ has done. In His name, we pray. Amen. So, uh, last time we talked about all of the uh, fancy word is extra biblical which just means outside the Bible, um, references and, and quotes and, and talking about Jesus and talking about the resurrection. Uh, we're looking at like a, like a word? court where we have all of these witnesses trying to describe an event, present it before the judge and the jury to make a decision, did the event happen? Um, and in much the same way, there's lots of different pieces of evidence you can present before the court. Uh, so we'll go back a couple here. So fact three, uh, third piece of evidence, right? The real followers of Jesus took his death hard. Fact four, days after his death, the tomb was empty. Right? And so we have Tacitus, uh, the great historian, Suetonius, um, another historian, talking about uh, the empty tomb, this, this mischievous religious belief. Um, and again, the mischievous superstition that the tomb was empty and Jesus was risen from the dead. Um, okay. So, uh, continuing on then. So, fact five. The real followers of Jesus stopped despairing, stopped despairing and, and they said why. And so when we look at the Bible, we always have to keep in mind the Bible is not a religious text in the sense of any other use in the world. So, like, you'll have, like, the... the what's the word? I just lost it. The stories about Zeus, right? Or the stories fables? about... Yeah, maybe fable, whatever it is. Legend, myth. Le yes. um, but they'll have their, their religious text. The Bible isn't, isn't like that. The Bible is a collection of historical documents which teach us about God. And so we, if we view it in that, in that frame, that it's, it's more than a religious text, this is a collection of ancient documents teaching us about God. Um, and so when we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's not just a story in the sense that we can learn about Hercules, or that we can learn about Ra, or the gods of the Aztecs. Um, but rather it's, this is what the eyewitnesses saw. And so in these historical documents, we see the disciples stop despairing about Jesus' death, and they tell us why. Um, and so they were absolutely crushed, when Jesus died, and we talked about that previously, <coughs> and now we're sharing why they were no longer crushed. Um, so a bunch of people run around and said that they saw Jesus was alive. And we learn about the 12 disciples, we learn about the 125 people in the upper room um, who were there when the Holy Spirit was there, and the 500 who saw him resurrected at one time. All of these people said that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. When the Bible gives names or numbers of people, that kind of thing. That's the Bible citing its sources. Based on testimony, hey, did you see Jesus? Yeah, well, I didn't see it, but my cousin Phil, he saw it. And so we can go talk to Phil about what he saw, that kind of thing. Um, historically speaking, it does not prove that Jesus rose. It just proves that the people who wrote these things thought that Jesus rose. Right. Again, we're taking this as a historical document. And so we have to ask the question, why would they lie? Again, as a document, it's not if it's true, but rather, do the authors believe it to be true? And so they do, right? The authors of the Bible believed that Jesus physically rose from the dead, and they wrote down the events as a historical document. I pass on what I saw. Three days after Jesus died, I saw him alive. And so I'm just telling you what I saw. Um, there are a bunch of, of humble fishermen, and I'm a tax collector, and whatever else, just saying, hey, just let me tell you what I saw. Jesus was alive after he died. 
Um, Josephus then is an, a step removed from that. He didn't see it, but he talked to people who did. This is what he writes. Those who become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. Right? They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, that he was alive, and accordingly he was perhaps the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. Um, and so Josephus, again, he's a Jewish propagandist, writing to the Romans to say why you don't want to exterminate all the Jews. Um, and so he's telling the stories about the Jewish people and the Messiah, what the wonders reported about the Messiah. So he's saying all of the things that Jesus has done, like the feeding of the 5,000, the calming of the storm, the casting out demons, the walking in waters, the restoring crippled limbs, whatever, raising Lazarus from the dead. That was one of the big ones. Um, and all spread about Jesus. And Josephus tells us he was a prophet, did a lot of good things, perhaps the Messiah, who appeared to them three days after he died. So we have these sources of people who are hostile to Christians outside the Bible talking about what's going on. Okay? Moving on then. Jews change their worship day. This is a very hard uh, piece of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And what day is the Sabbath? Saturday. Right. Friday sundown till Saturday sundown. Yep, yep. And in, in, the, in the Jewish mindset, that's the Sabbath, okay. right? And that follows the, the pattern of creation. God created the world for six days, and then the seventh day he rested. And so he told us creation, for six days you're going to work, and the seventh day you're going to rest. Uh, and when you think of rest, don't think of taking a nap. That's not what God's talking about there. That's a different Bible study. Um, but the Sabbath day was super, super important that throughout the Old Testament, God gets into very specific details about the things you can and cannot do on the Sabbath day. Uh, for example, one of the things that God specifically states you cannot do is build a fire. You cannot build a fire on the Sabbath day. And he expands it further. You cannot collect sticks to build a fire on the Sabbath day. And then it gets expanded even further and further and further you know, to modern um, religious Jews who say you can't turn a light switch. You can't adjust the flame on your gas stove. Um, you can't push an elevator button because that's building a fire, which is breaking the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is, is that vitally important to the life of the Jewish people. And so for these super religious Jews... Um, the super zealous Pharisees, like the Apostle Paul, to switch worship days, where they no longer worship on Saturday, but now they worship on Sunday. <coughs> that kind of cosmic shift um, cannot be explained um, apart from Jesus rising from the dead. <coughs> but they're not Jewish because I'm confused. The Jews still celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday. Right. Not the uh, not the completed Jews. Mm -hmm. not, right. not the Christian Jews. The Messi Messianic. Yeah, the Messianic Jews. Yeah. Got it. Yep. And so that was this was a debate that took place. We see it in the Bible. Um, Peter and Paul talk about it. The Apostle John talks about it. It's in Scripture. Which day of the week do you worship on? And because Jesus rose from the dead, that's why we settled on Sunday. And they say that in the Bible. Well, they say that we can worship on Sunday in the Bible, not that we have to worship on Sunday in the Bible. We choose to worship on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They, they said that second part. Yep. Yep. Um, so Paul says, some esteem one day better than the other. Um, John specifically talks about the Sabbath day on the days of the week. Um, and then we talk, do it on we worship on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. So did the calendar also change? What do you mean? Um, that's the beginning of the week for me? Yeah, because Sunday is the first day of the week. Yep. On our calendar. Yep, and so we're worshiping on the first day of the week now instead of on the seventh day, like the Jews do. So Sunday is always the first day of the Sunday week. is always the first day of the week. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, and so there's a group of Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists, 
um, who are advocating that we need to stop worshiping on Sunday, and if everybody worshiped on Saturday, like you're supposed to, that Jesus would come back, which isn't in the Bible. But that's what they teach. Um, and so they switch days because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Um, that's another evidence for Jesus' resurrection. You don't just break a tradition like that. Um, something so ingrained into the life of the people, their most important tradition doesn't get broken that easily. Um, something cosmic had to happen to, to cause that shift. Um, I like looking at Sabbath laws. It's just a fun thing to, to read about and their, their histories and how they've changed and, um, and to see all of that just torn away. Um, a lot of that sacredness around the Sabbath day comes from the exile. So when the Jews were forcibly removed from Jerusalem and had to spend the 70 years in exile in Babylon, when they come back, one of the things that they cite for their exile was breaking the Sabbath day. And so then it became super extra important to keep the Sabbath day so as not to go into exile again. Uh, and so it's always, always on their forefront. Can't be overstated how big of a deal that was. Okay? All right. Um, fact number seven. The resurrection was public. Um, it, it, it happened in, in Jerusalem. Right? It was a big city for its day. This wasn't an event that said, oh yeah, you know, there's, you know, out in Nazareth, this town of 65 people, this guy rose from the dead. No, no. It happened in a big city. Uh, when uh, someone said Jesus was alive, so if, if like Peter's talking, someone said, hey, Jesus is alive, uh, they could then walk to the tomb and see if Jesus was alive or not. Um, the body wasn't found. The antagonists say the body was stolen. And so at the end of the Gospel of John, you read that the Pharisees were bribing the guards to say the body was stolen. Remember that part? What that teaches us is that the tomb was empty, right? Uh, that there was nobody in the tomb, and they were trying to explain away what happened. Um, a very, very public event. Everybody knew about it. It was on the news. Um, and there was just, wasn't just some guy somewhere saying something that can't be verified. It happened in a public place. He was crucified publicly and he rose publicly. Fact 8, the conversion of Saul. Um, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, you don't have to believe that Paul, that Saul saw Jesus face to face. Right? So this takes place in the book of Acts. If you're trying to deny the resurrection of Jesus, you say that Jesus did not rise from the dead, and you don't have to believe that Paul saw Jesus. Okay? But you still have to explain why he converted to Christianity. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Cats meow. Right? He was the guy that like every, every little religious boy wanted to be when they grew up. They wanted to be Saul. Um, and so what event would cause someone who was at the top of the hierarchy, um, so we're talking you know, the, the, the pinnacle of the thing here, he's at the very top, the most respect, the most honor, the most fame, the most glory, the most wealth, the most power, the most all of it. He's the guy that the people you look up to, look up to, right? Um, he is the golden child of perfect Jew. What would cause him to sacrifice all of the good things that he had to go and live a life of destitution and torture and persecution and whatever else. Or in God's word, I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. Right. Would he be the Jesus of a Pharisee as well? Yes. So were they like people or was Saul? Like he was above Nicodemus. Wow. So Saul was younger. Uh, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. But Saul was a, a rising star um, and was very, very high on the list of this guy. It was very clearly understood that he was going to be the next high priest. He was going to be the next leader. Um, we see this in the stoning of Stephen. When all of the other Pharisees take their coats and they place them at Saul's feet when they go and they, when they stone Stephen. I mean, it's not that Saul was there just kind of as, you know, the coat check, make sure everybody got their coat back. They're signifying that Saul has the authority to give the execution orders for Stephen. Um, 
he's the one who's, who's, who's got that kind of thing going on. Um, and so the stoning of Stephen falls at the feet of Saul. Um, he's the one who authorized the stoning of Stephen. Um, and so to go from that, religious terrorist and zealot, uh, to Christian, there is no explanation given except for what he says. Right, where he says, yeah, I saw Jesus, and then I was blind, um, and, and then I repented of my sins and became a Christian. Um, and then the second big conversion to explain is James, the author of the book of James. Um, Jesus had brother. And so James went from thinking that Jesus is crazy to be not only one of his disciples, but also one of the leaders of the church. Um, he was like a, a Pope-esque figure in the early church. It was, it was him, and, him and Peter and Paul were the three, the three big leaders. And so James, if we look at the book of Matthew or the book of Luke, um, we read that when Jesus returned home um, to visit his family in Nazareth, his family thought that he was crazy. Right? Who is this guy? This, was, this used to be my big brother. You know, who's this guy here? Um, and then they, they try to throw him off a cliff. Right? So they, they want those things about his own brother completely the other way to worshiping him as God um, and becoming a leader in the church. And the only explanation for that change for these two gentlemen uh, is their own words that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. If you deny Jesus' resurrection, you have to explain the conversion of Paul and the conversion of James. Um, and you have to do it contradicting what Paul and James say about themselves. Pack 9. Um, these are historical substances to Christianity. Christian, the, the Bible is not a religious text in the way we think of the words religious text. It's a description of reality. This is how the world works. Um, does it have religious things in it? Yes, but Christianity is more than a religion. Christianity is truth. This is just how the world works. And so there is, if there is a historical event, if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. Right? The Apostle Paul says to himself, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then we are above all people to be pitied because we're still in our sins. So if there's no resurrection, where did Christianity come from? Specifically, how did Christianity come out of the Jewish faith in Jerusalem if Jesus did not rise from the dead? Jesus was not the first person to claim to be the Messiah, and he was not the last person to claim to be the Messiah. Why did everybody follow Jesus as, as the Messiah? Why not the other Messiahs? Because he is the Messiah, because he rose from the dead. <coughs> the existence of Christianity does not prove the resurrection happened, but it proved that early Christians thought the resurrection really happened, that Jesus was the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. I'm curious um, if you know what do atheists believe or how do they believe Christianity came about? Yeah, so there's a few a few popular things. Um, there's the stolen body theory, the swoon theory, or the mass hallucination theory. Those are the three options that have been presented as the most likely um, explanations for how Christianity came about. Um, and these three are the only ones that have been given, and they've been given since the very, very beginning. Um, even in the Bible, they, they talk about these. So the first is the stolen body, and that's the disciples overpowered the guards, rolled the stone away, broke the seal, stole Jesus' body, and then went around claiming he rose from the dead. That might explain some things, but it doesn't explain doesn't explain the conversion of Paul, doesn't explain the conversion of James, and it doesn't explain the transition away from worshiping on Saturday to Sunday. Um, the swoon theory—that's the idea that Jesus didn't actually <coughs> die, that uh, on the cross he just kind of fainted, and everybody thought that he was dead, that he was really very fainted, but not dead. And after spending three days in the cold tomb, the cool air refreshed him, and he was able to then walk out of the tomb. Um, so he didn't die on the cross, he swooned on the cross. A number of problems with that. 
Um, first problem is the Romans are really good at killing people. Um, and it was the practice of the Roman Empire that if the person survived crucifixion, the people who crucified him had to die in their place. Uh, and so they were very, very good at making sure that the people who were crucified actually died. Um, second was the spear wound. Right, so Jesus wasn't just crucified. He had the big spear jammed up in his side, um, which pierced his heart and blood and water came out, just as you would expect medically to take place. Um, then also, how would he overpower the guards? How would he roll the tomb open? And it's not a very convincing resurrection if you look in there beaten up and bloody, the big scar where you're stabbed by a spear, your back all torn to shreds by being scourged. That doesn't work as a triumphant resurrection. Doesn't explain the events. The last one is mass hallucination. Um, that's where everybody was so driven grief stricken, I can talk, I promise, um, that they thought that they saw Jesus. Numbers of problems with that. Um, our understanding of how the brain works has increased significantly since it was first proposed. You cannot hallucinate about something you don't know. Your mind can't make something up um, in, in that sense, uh, or at least for hallucinations. Um, and so the Apostle Paul be having the hallucination about Jesus doesn't work. Um, also, there is no such thing as a mass hallucination. Nobody sees the same thing when they're hallucinating. Everybody sees something different. And so for the 12, the 120, the people at Pentecost, the 500 at one time, does not explain it. All of them are falling short, and in fact their shortcomings are pointed out by non-Christians um, because they're trying to find something better to fill it in. There isn't one. Um, the one that's, that's spread most now is just the disciples lied. Um, but that doesn't explain the conversion of Paul, with the Phoenix person of James, or the hundreds of people who saw Jesus at the same time. It, it doesn't, doesn't add up. Or how the tomb got empty. What's that? Or how the tomb got empty. Yep, yep. So, there's a fourth option. Unbelievable. Goes against nature, but it explains all the facts that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Um, so if you have a Bible in front of you, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's one of the best chapters of the Bible, if not the very best chapter of the Bible. Um, let me give you guys Bibles to take a look at this quick. Corinthians 15, First Corinthians 15 is a chapter that every Christian needs to be. 12.22. 12.22. It's a chapter that every Christian needs to be familiar with. Um, it is it's incredibly important um, and it, the whole chapter is devoted to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, it is the, the highlight of First Corinthians the Apostle Paul just just lays out the resurrection of the dead. Um, so we have here the first part of chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. This is the first creed. We talked about this at the beginning of the Bible study. Um, and so even by the time 1 Corinthians is written, there's already a creed formed. Um, we said the Athanasian Creed today. This is the first creed. This is how you taught people things about Jesus being born or Jesus being the Messiah. And then we have the resurrection of the dead. We're talking about how Jesus was raised from the dead, so one day all of us will be raised from the dead. Um, um, starting out here, if Christ is proclaimed as raised in verse 12, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Right? You cannot deny that people will be raised from the dead, because if you're denying that, you deny that Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. Again, the Apostle Paul laying out how important Jesus' resurrection is here. Um, then going on to verse 35, some will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? You foolish person. Um, 
what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. He uses an analogy of farming. Right? If you take a seed off a piece, you take a kernel off a piece of corn, the kernel's dead. You plant it in the ground and it grows. Uh, same thing for us. Um, we will be dead once, and we'll get planted in the ground, and we'll be raised um, to a new, a new life. Um, and then, at the end here, in chap at verse, verse 54, the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass what is written, death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is your sting? Or where is your victory, O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of the sin is the law, but thanks be to God, who has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll encourage you to read chapter 15 um, today. It's, it's, it's worth reading. It goes through and explains Jesus rising from the dead. And so the only explanation for all of the things we talked about, looking at the sources outside the Bible, looking at the sources inside the Bible, looking at the day of the week that we worship on, the people who believe in Jesus, the fact that Christianity became out of Judaism, and so many other things, the only explanation without taking it on faith, as the Bible is a book of faith, the only way to explain all of that is that Jesus rose from the dead. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, one of them didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees, the did. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The in, Pharisees did. In the resurrection yep. itself. Yep. Yep. But the Pharisees did. And the Sadducees did not. <coughs> and Paul was a Pharisee. Yes. Yeah. I strongly, strongly encourage uh, this. Did the resurrection by a resurrection happen by Gary Abermas? Um, it is the most exhaustive information on it. Uh, Gary Abermas got his PhD in theology from Michigan State, um, and the theology department there. Their opinion was, we don't want a bunch of Christians giving another Christian a PhD. And so his PhD committee was atheists and Jews and Muslims. Um, so that was, it's, you know, it has to be rigorous academics kind of thing. And his PhD is, did the resurrection happen? Um, and so he goes through and looks at all of these things um, in a very, very high level and talks about it. And he, is, he uses even less sources than I used um, to explain how it takes place. Um, Gary Habermas is a cool guy. He's very easy to understand. He's not a high pollutant language kind of guy. He's pretty down to earth. Um, he's the farmer who went and got a degree. Um, and so he's definitely worth reading. He also has a video on YouTube um, where he goes through and explains it all. It's about an hour and a half long, but it's well worth the watch. Did the resurrection happen by Gary Habermas? Um, I will strongly, strongly recommend that. And so yeah, the only the only explanation for all of this stuff is that, historically speaking, Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. Any last questions? We've got a couple minutes left. Um, is there anything you would like me to prepare for another Bible study? We'll probably take a break from Bible study, talk to the baby's born, because um, I may or may not be here next week. And the following week, I'm certainly not going to be here. Um, no, but is there something that you guys like to take a look at? Or should I just pick something? Even current events, like Roe versus Wade or any of that type of thing? Yeah, whatever. Like, we talked about that. By that time, you may be more information on decisions and stuff. By that time. Sure. What should be happening in the next month? Or not? <coughs> I think um, that really is supposed to come out in the next couple of weeks. First, they pretty much have to have yeah. their decisions. Yeah, by the end of June. Yeah. 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 How to respectfully respond at the <coughs> point in time to two people and uh, there are very strong there there will be very strong feelings and how the country responds and how we can respond in this bad during the or two though. So yeah. That's a good idea. That's Actually when that ruling comes down Basically, nothing changes. The states that are doing whatever they're doing will still be doing whatever they're doing. Yes, individual states, though, right? But 
it'll take power away from the federal. It, it, it'll change, it will change. There will be states that will have abortion completely outlawed. But they have to, I mean, it takes time for them to do that. But at, at the time the ruling comes down, actually nothing will change. Nope, nope. So there are 13 states which have what's called trigger laws. So in the moment that it's overturned, the law 